going to talk about bar metallurgy today. Now, most companies, when they have a bar, the number that they show is tensile strength. And that's uh, related to, to its performance or mechanical characteristics. But it doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. So if I have a given load, the bar is going to flex. Like when you go to deadlift, that bar bends up. When it's sitting on your back, when it's squatting, it bends to a certain amount. Tensile strength does not affect that. Young's modulus of elasticity determines this. And that happens to be pretty much uniform across all steel and steel alloys. That means that you're going to get the same exact bend in the bar with a given load if the mechanical properties of the bar are the same, as in the distance between the plates and the diameter of the bar. They're all going to bend the same. So that's interesting. So how people need to control that is both the diameter of the bar, that's why uh, 29 millimeter bars for power bar that are on the top end of the spec is going to be better. The closer you bring the weights in, again, the more of that you're going to get. So, but what is interesting is that doesn't equate to oscillation. So oscillation is basically, think of it as a spring, that spring effect of the bar. And that's where both the alloy of your, that you're choosing and the heat treat process, which will equate out to Rockwell hardness that we'll talk about in a little bit, can actually reduce that spring effect in the bar. So as it's sitting on your back in the squat, it's going to be bouncing around. That bounce or spring effect will minimize. It'll still sit and bend the same, same thing on deadlift. It's going to bend up the same amount before it pulls off the ground. But halfway up, that bar is not going to whip or oscillate hard and try to rip it out of your hands. So there's nothing in the medical or metallurgy books that actually covers this effect. So this comes down to a lot of testing with different alloys and heat treat processes. But we have found that both a higher tensile strength combined with, which is related to, to Rockwell hardness, will have an effect when done in combination with the correct alloy. You can actually bring that spring effect down. So what tensile strength does affect is if the load goes high enough, let's say we put 2,000 pounds on this bar, the bar will bend, and again, they will all bend the same amount, but the higher the tensile strength, and which actually equates to uh, yield strength, so tensile strength and yield strength numbers are, are different, but they're uh, related to each other. So the higher tensile strength goes, the higher the yield strength goes. So that bar will bend and then deform. So the amount of load taken to deform the bar is less with the lower amount of tensile strength or yield strength. So if you have a much higher, like in ours, a 258,000 tensile strength, we're going to be able to take a significant amount more load than 190 or 205 or whatever else bar that you've got on, on the market, which we did test uh, in our testing. We did start at uh, uh, 18,000 newtons. So that's just a calculation of the amount of weight versus how long we dropped it from and, uh, and then how much the bar bounced back from there uh, to calculate the, uh, the amount of force where ours went up to 26,000 before we started seeing deformation. So, and then that also relates to how much did it deform. Um, so, um, given the same load, we ran it up to 34,000 newtons um, with our drop test. We had almost a half inch, or actually more than a half inch of testing of bend, permanent bend in the bar where it didn't return uh, with 190,000 uh, PSI bar. We had a quarter inch of deformation with the 205, and then we had a uh, little less than an uh, eighth of an inch uh, permanent deformation in our bar. So that's that. Now, Rockwell hardness is an entering like I said. Uh, Rockwell hardness actually nets you your calculation for tensile and yield strength. But Rockwell hardness, and uh, we're using HRC where they're using a diamond point uh, test on this, but you actually try to penetrate the material and see how deep it can go. And that gives you your Rockwell hardness. That is really critical in understanding how long the knurl is going to last. If anybody's been to a competition where you've got a lot of bars that have been sitting around a while, or bars sitting in a rack that have been in the gym for a while, you notice that the knurl's worn down. Or mild strength bars. Like I said, there's a competitor bar to our duffalo bar. You go into a gym, the knurl's almost always worn off because they're, they're just mild steel and not a hardened steel. So. <clears throat> This is, uh, this is really significant with how long that bar is going to last. How long is that neural going to be the same 
before it starts degrading down and wearing down to a, to a non-usable amount. So all of this, Rockwell hardness, tensile strength, are the numbers that are going to, wait to equate to basically the longevity of this bar. How many loads, how much load can it take before it deforms? How much hits can it take before it deforms? How long is the neural going to last? All these things. So ours is a 51 uh, HRC. And we did a, a test where we used our bar as the cutting tool to put against these competitors' bars. Um, the 190 lasted for five seconds. The uh, 205 bar lasted for seven seconds. I gave up after five minutes. Um, we can show the picture of uh, where it was at after five minutes of uh, using our bar against our bar. Uh, again, uh, the neural is damn near nearly indestructible. You're going to end up over time having to replace J hooks or other things on your equipment because the bar is going to stay the same. It's just not going to wear out. So why is our bar basically the hardest, longest lasting, most durable bar out there that's going to perform as good or better than uh, all the other bars? Why isn't anybody else doing it? It is hard and there's risk with it. So what happens when you take that hardness up to increase the tensile strength and, the, and well, the, the hardness itself is you induce embrittlement potential in the bar. So what's going to happen is that bar basically isn't going to bend. It'll, it'll bend to a certain point, but it'll never deform. Once you add that load to a certain point, the bar will snap. You'll have an embrittlement issue. So the other thing is you can't machine it. So you have to machine it first, then harden it. Now you're going to have a bunch of warpage going on in the bar, and the bar is not going to be straight. So with our processes, and this is pulled a lot from my background, and it still took us quite a bit of testing to get this to where we need to, but we can bend our bars and we've demonstrated that in our testing. We test uh, our bars on a, on a break as well where we induce a load. We have no embrittlement issues. We have no warpage issues. Ours are straight to within 10 thousandths of an inch over the eight foot length. It's a fraction of the thickness of a piece of paper. So we've resolved those issues with our processes. You know, that's our proprietary information on the manufacturing processes, but the output is this that we have the hardest, most longest lasting bar, most durable bar on the market. You buy this bar, you're gonna have this bar for 30 years. You're gonna give it to your kids or your grandkids. And at the same time, it's gonna perform as good or better than any other bar out there. Now, some of you might be wondering, why is some meathead trying to sell you barbells? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on myself for those that aren't familiar with me, or my professional background. So I went to school for both manufacturing engineering and mechanical engineering. I did go get my MBA later as well, but that doesn't really relate to the technical discussion here. But I ended up working in operations, manufacturing operations, and I did that for two decades. And the second half of that was focused primarily on automotive and aerospace. So in those roles or in those companies, did a lot of like uh, gear train manufacturing, manufacturing of critical flight components uh, for Boeing, C-17, Bombardier, things of that nature. So in my role, um, I was responsible for uh, all of operations, particularly the last decade was usually uh, executive type roles where basically all of manufacturing engineering and typically a lot of uh, design engineering, uh, all the engineers would report up through an engineering manager, report to myself, and I was also responsible for operations, which means control of quality, uh, manufacturing processes, everything involved with making sure that those components meet uh, specifications and doing it in a cost-effective manner and achieving the quality output. So during the course of that, did some great projects. So was involved with the launch of the, uh, the Dodge Power Wagon. Uh, did a lot of work with Boeing on the 737, but was responsible uh, for leading uh, some of the critical timeline for the launch in regards to the, the 787 Dreamliner with a lot of the components that went into that. Uh, did military uh, projects, both automotive and aerospace. So like I mentioned earlier, C-17 uh, was, uh, was something we worked with. Uh, also was involved with the, the launch of the mine resistant uh, vehicles that went into uh, Desert Storm as well uh, to protect our troops from mines blowing up underneath and building a lot of the, uh, the components with that. So significant amount of experience in dealing with a lot of different materials and manufacturing processes, both from the design and manufacturing standpoint. So yes, I do know a little bit about this.